Uh, let me just start uh, first with maybe we can just organize like this. We can start with Osofet. I can give you 20 minutes. I don't know. Whatever you you like, you can use it, but around 20 minutes, Osofet. I already sent out the questions and you have also uh, your own questions to, to be answered. And uh, then we can uh, ask questions to uh, Sofet together with you, Matt. Then we can turn back to you. You can use your 20 minutes. And at the end of the session, I am planning to giving you all uh, three minutes for each, just to, you know, maybe you have just something to add, something forgotten. Then we can say goodbye. Uh, it all happens in one hour if it is possible. I don't want to uh, take your all time. So thank you very much again. I am just starting with the official opening like uh, just right now. And okay. uh, um, for our audience, we are together with uh, Dr. Sofet Karbus. Uh, he is the uh, director of hydrocarbon uh, section of Observatory of Mediterranean Dollar Energy, OME, based in Paris. We know each other and Turkey knows him very well. He is one of the best experts in all that uh, is met, uh, let's say the issues. Uh, our topic for today is what is next in ISMET, especially moving U.S. Army to, uh, let's say, the, the air base in Alexandropolis and the latest three license areas given to Exxon. Uh, what kind of, you know, uh, the water is hot water or still cold, I'm not sure, but also some meetings and Syria is coming, Lebanon is there. So what kind of problems do we have? And also, yeah, together with Matt Breiza, uh, we know him uh, from the uh, Port Corridor projects. He is the, the former uh, ambassador to Azerbaijan of the United States, a very well respected, uh, also expert in everywhere, especially this kind of East West uh, energy uh, issues as well. Oh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for uh, just mm -hmm. joining us for today. Thank if you want, I would like to give the floor to Sopet and he can just start, then we can just continue together. Sopet, we are in with you. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the first question was that what are the prospects for the uh, monetization of EastMed gas? Now, that uh, will, of course, depend on how much gas the region has and how much uh, surplus gas uh, can the region export in the future. Now, uh, without going into details, just to give a summary, until today, around 5 trillion cubic meters of natural gas has been discovered in East Met region. So in 19, uh, the first discovery was in 19, uh, 69 offshore Abu Kir field and between 1969 and today 5 trillion cubic meters. And the interesting thing is that half of this amount has been discovered since uh, 2009. So in a short period uh, of time, uh, half of these discoveries have been made. But this is just the discovery part. I mean, this 3.5 trillion cubic meters that has been discovered. And uh, when we add also uh, uh, undiscovered potential, but we can put it in a separate uh, issue for the moment. When we look, just look at the uh, discovered amount, it is more or less equivalent of Norway. But when we add the undiscovered potential, uh, so the region would be equivalent to North Sea. North Sea, I mean, uh, Norway plus Denmark plus UK uh, and Netherlands. So this is uh, this is why the region is is, is so important. And uh, so there are some maybe uncertainties about this undiscovered potential. You know, for this, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey is the, the, the most important authority in the world. So uh, they were saying that uh, there is a huge amount of uh, undiscovered potential, around 10 trillion cubic meters, so uh, more than double uh, the size of, uh, of the amount that has been discovered so far. And uh, the U.S. Ge Geological Survey has confirmed this assessment uh, in its uh, latest uh, publication in July this year. So uh, there is still 
a huge amount. Of course, uh, these are the amounts on the paper. You have to uh, drill and, and find it. But uh, we have seen a big progress, you know, uh, in uh, in Israel and the Greek Cyprus, uh, and uh, just exploration activities are uh, or will continue in in Lebanon and Turkey. Also, uh, did some explorations in that region that were assessed, that was assessed by by the U.S. Geological Survey. So, in a in a snapshot. Uh, Israel, for example, was a net importer, uh, thanks to large discoveries, became a, a, a net gas exporter. Egypt is, uh, is exporting, and perhaps uh, Lebanon will find something, uh, as we say, inshallah, and uh, then will join the, the train. So... Uh, the amount normally, the, the people, when we look at the future gas export potential, the, 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 the forecast varies. So at OME, we are more optimistic. We are more optimistic in the sense that we demand, depending on the demand profile, we, we have several uh, options, whether the people uh, or the countries in the region will push more forward for renewables, and energy efficiency and net zero aims, etc. So uh, the uh, exports uh, could reach up to 40 billion cubic meters in the future. This is in, in the most optimistic uh, case. Now, uh, the, the important problem is not the amount of the gas that could be uh, produced. Of course, you have the, the demand, but uh, potentially uh, at least at least 20 to 30 billion cubic meters of gas could be exported from the region. Now, the problem here is the infrastructure, how you export this, this gas. So what we see for the moment, except for LNG exports from Egypt, all the gas is traded within the region. But we know that there are some uh, additional plans to increase uh, gas production. For example, Leviathan field. So they want to double the, the production capacity from 12 to 24 billion cubic meters. Now, the issue, for example, Israel, which is the key in that region in terms of exports, how to export this gas? So currently, Israel exports part of the gas to Jordan and part of the gas to Israel, sorry, to, to, to Egypt. But uh, these markets are already saturated. There is uh, no option to uh, export more gas uh, to Jordan or to, uh, to, to Egypt. But uh, they have to aim to distant markets. What are the options? Uh, Turkey, well, we know uh, this uh, Turkey-Israel uh, pipeline will not go ahead, at least in the current uh, political and commercial uh, terms. Uh, to the pipeline, to East Med gas pipeline to Greece and uh, and then forward to Italy, uh, God knows, but uh, I cannot comment on that because of OME, you know. And uh, But uh, many people say that it is uh, technically feasible, but commercially not. And it is not backed by the producer companies in the region. It is mostly... Uh, promoted by uh, by the governments and more uh, political. Now, uh, if you cannot export to Egypt to uh, by pipeline to, to, to Europe, uh, not also to Turkey, the only option would be, of course, LNG. But there, uh, we have the problem. Uh, is, uh, Egypt would prefer, of course, to export its own gas rather than uh, Israeli gas to distant markets because LNG is the future. Um, this is today the, the, the case. Why bind yourself with a pipeline and God knows what will happen in the future and uh, considering the, the EU, this Green Deal and the other things is that gas is polluting fuel and we will not... Uh, we will not in the future, they say, uh, you know, uh, finance the, the gas the infrastructure projects, etc. So the price, the, uh, the 
gas demand in Asia is booming. The uh, LNG demand in Asia is booming. The prices in Asia is, is higher and demand is there. So it is the best way to export uh, regional gas surplus to Asian markets via LNG. That is, that is the key. So uh, that is why Israel, I mean, basically Chevron and Delek, uh, the main partners in, in, in Tamar and Leviathan. So they are considering two options. One, uh, considering the possibility that, that uh, Egypt may not have its own gas to export via ITCO LNG terminal and ITCO LNG plant, we could uh, connect the Leviathan field with ITCO by pipeline and then export uh, from the plant uh, from there. Or what uh, Chevron is considering now, the feasibilities uh, are about to be, be uh, finalized. And uh, actually, uh, before Chevron took over uh, Noble Energy, uh, it was still option, floating LNG. Uh, let's have a, a FLNG facility in, in Israel so that we are flexible, not binded, uh, you know, these pipelines, uh, and uh, be more, more flexible and then we can export uh, wherever we want. So uh, maybe the best option uh, for the moment is to target LNG, but how uh, most probably, I mean, uh, it would be perhaps more sense, uh, FLNG. But when we talk about the pipeline and a little bit future, future developments, uh, you know, Lebanon, uh, now uh, we initialize the second uh, international bidding round. And instead of five blocks, now they offer all the remaining blocks. Uh, so we will see what will happen. But if a gas is discovered, if gas is discovered in, in Lebanon, they won't have any export uh, facility. So uh, on the other hand, we have this Arab gas pipeline. 10 billion cubic meters per year capacity is uh, is basically uh, parts of it used in, to, in insignificant amounts. So that, that pipeline could be revitalized to uh, gather uh, gas from both uh, Egypt that could not be exported through LNG, uh, also from Israel and also from Jordan, and the pipeline was already connected up to the border of Turkey and uh, could come to Turkey and maybe uh, for further exports to, to Europe, uh, preferably by Botash pipelines. And, uh, you know, this is another option, but a, a longer term. The shorter term is, is LNG. This is the way that I see the, the best way to, um, to export gas. But then you have the second question, what is the most profitable option for export uh, Israeli gas? Now, uh, when we look at the current dynamics in the region, especially uh, starting the, with, the, with the political uh, issues like the Abraham uh, Accords in August 2020, and when we look at the, the regional energy dynamics, as I said previously, the, the markets, gas markets are in the region saturated. Jordan doesn't need any more gas, okay? So you cannot export any more gas to, to, to Jordan. And Egypt doesn't need any more Israeli gas uh, because, because of several reasons. Uh, I will explain maybe later on if uh, we have time, but I don't want to spend too much time for now on, on, on this issue. And... Uh, Lebanon, of course, uh, need gas, but the, the, the amount is, is, is small. And now when we look at uh, a little bit in the future, for me, the best way to utilize the excess, uh, excess gas production is to convert it to electricity and trade this electricity within the region by taking the account of the advantage of normalization of relations with Israel with Arab countries in the region. So that means produce the gas uh, in Egypt or in Jordan or in Israel and export it as electricity 
to uh, UAE, to Iraq, to God knows Saudi Arabia uh, or in the South uh, Sudan and even westward to, to Libya. So this is the best way because you uh, create and value added. So that is why, and plus employment, uh, plus uh, attracting in investments. So not only exporting raw gas, but uh, export uh, uh, exported as, 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 as elect electricity. So that is, I can combine it, what is the role of East Med Gas Forum in natural gas sector of the region. Well, natural gas uh, was the uh, catalysator factor of countries in the region to be unified uh, under uh, East Med Gas Forum. But then we saw the normalization of relations between Israel and uh, several Arab countries. And then when we look at the recent uh, 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 ministerial uh, meetings that took place, the, one, the latest one was, I think, a week or two, two ago, uh, and especially after EU and United States have become observer, we see that in the statements and, uh, and future work program, uh, there is more and more push to uh, integration of electricity markets, renewables, and clean energy forms like hydrogen. So uh, I would expect that uh, the East Mid Gas Forum will not keep its uh, activities restricted to gas. It will uh, and it will be enlarged to uh, renewables hydrogen and electricity. In that way, uh, I do not personally think that East Med Gas Forum will keep the name East Med Gas Forum. Maybe it will turn into East Med Energy Forum. But when we look at again, the, uh, carefully all the uh, declarations by the ministers in uh, ministerial meetings in East Med uh, Gas Forum meetings, there is uh, always some political elements are put or add, added into the into the gas forum uh, ismet gas forum uh, activities so maybe in the future uh, we will even drop the energy and it will say just ismet forum east mediterranean forum so this is how i see but definitely in my view uh, it will not keep the name East Med Gas Forum because it is going beyond gas. So definitely beyond gas means beyond gas uh, to electricity and renewables and hydro hydrogen. Somehow it will, it will come into the question. Now, there is a, 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 a very recent developments you all uh, follow the, after the, this normalization of uh, relations uh, not only this Abraham Rico, uh, Accord, but in uh, uh, on five uh, January five two thousand twenty one, we had also the normalization of relations with Qatar and Egypt, and you know Gulf uh, Cooperation Council uh, sent signed this Al Ula Declaration. So Qatar will be maybe uh, um, attracted in the area. Afterwards, we saw quick developments. You know. Uh, this development of Gaza field and uh, Gaza marine field, and then uh, bringing gas to uh, to Lebanon through Syria. By the way, uh, well, it is always declared that it is Egyptian gas to be exported to to Lebanon, but uh, I do not understand how, because infrastructure wise. Uh, that is not possible. Uh, so uh, it will be, in fact, reshuffling of Israeli gas by different swaps or whatever. Uh, it will reach to to Lebanon. So Lebanon is is uh, in the picture, and meanwhile, Jordan and and uh, Syria, you know, 
uh, after this anomizetes, uh, there is a, a, a kind of political approachment. So why not, if these things uh, uh, are realized because it is supported by the World Bank and the United States, so uh, strong backing, uh, why not in the near future, Syria and uh, Lebanon uh, would join uh, to Ismet Gas Forum. Because there is another issue that is continuing. Uh, Matt knows it uh, mostly, most probably better, much better than, than me. Uh, there is this uh, offshore uh, boundary agreements uh, or discussions on that uh, promoted by or uh, facilitated by the United States. If uh, a solution is fine, found on this issue. Uh, so we see a, a better and more normal uh, political relations developing in the region. So if those countries, either full member or observe it, doesn't matter. So, but bringing them into East Med Gas Forum uh, will be a major challenge for the region, but Turkey would still be outside. Now, with Turkey relation, uh, uh, improving the relations uh, with the other key uh, countries like uh, Israel and, and Egypt might change the picture, but we should not forget, we should not be too optimistic. Starting from January 2022, Cyprus will, be, will take over the presidency of Ismet Gas Forum. Now, uh, what will happen? Uh, I don't know. Now, uh, quickly, I uh, go on uh, your other questions. Yes, Exxon uh, will continue drilling. Now, we'll continue drilling, but uh, we have seen two new developments. Exxon, for months already, uh, announced that uh, it will drill an appraisal well in its further, uh, in its previous uh, discovery to confirm, to confirm the discovery. Uh, so that uh, was already known. Actually, it was expected to, uh, to take place in, in November, but uh, it, it didn't. Uh, so this uh, Glacus uh, discovery. But then we have seen uh, uh, yesterday it was uh, this, the, uh, uh, the agreement has been signed by Exxon uh, Qatar and uh, Greek Cyprus government on uh, the rewarding of uh, Block 5 to Exxon and, and Qatar. So they think that this uh, the carbon net uh, structure of ZOR, which is just across uh, the Block 10 of, uh, of uh, Exxon and, and and uh, Qatar Petroleum would extend to black block five. So uh, they will probably uh, will conduct an exploratory drilling also in block five. Uh, well, if the people, of course, don't know what is block five, but is uh, block 10, later on I can show uh, maybe some pictures uh, to make it, uh, to make it uh, visually uh, clear, but, uh, if the time time allows, because uh, you you pro, uh, ask uh, some deep questions, it is uh, nearly impossible to uh, to <laughs> summarize. So I just uh, jump to the conclusions. Uh, sorry for that, but uh, yes, uh, Exxon will continue. Now the other issue is that what are the uh, other options for the uh, for the other companies in the region, because. Before COVID uh, occurred last year, uh, we had 13 planned exploratory well and appraisal well drillings uh, to take place in Greek Cyprus blocks. And because of COVID, because of uh, drop, huge drop in oil and gas prices, the companies had to cut their exploratory or upstream expenses. So that is why these plans have been pushed forward to first to 2021 and now to 2022. So uh, most probably 
we will see some additional uh, exploratory or uh, appraisal wells to be drilled uh, next year by Total and ENI in the in the area. But for sure, we know uh, for the moment that Exxon Exxon will drill uh, in in Block Ten uh, in the coming days. And uh, we will see the results uh, in March next year. So uh, about the, 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 the prospects. So uh, this, uh, this didn't somehow uh, attracted much criticism by Turkey because uh, I see the media and sometimes the officials uh, are divided on this issue because uh, similar to what happened to Aphrodite, you know, this is not, uh, the area is not within the, the blocks that are given by uh, Turkish Cypriots to Turkish petroleum. And also it does not overlap with Turkey's uh, continental shelf. And that is why they can do whatever they want. So this is a wrong approach. This is a wrong approach because it contradicts with Turkey's claim that the resources in the in the south belongs also to Turks, so uh, the Turkish Cypriots, and that is why they also have to say, uh, have have to raise their voice, and they are the the joint uh, owners of these resources. So we cannot say that this area is not uh, overlapping with Turkish continental shelf or, or not uh, overlapping with the blocks that are given by Turkish Cyprus to Turkish petrol. This is a wrong approach. And, but, but this issue has become uh, more urgent when uh, block five in, the, in, in Greek Cyprus was awarded to Exxon and Qatar because part of the block five is is overlapping with Turkish uh, Turkish continental shelf. So that was, uh, of, of course, uh, that created a, a big noise. And uh, But probably what will happen is that Exxon already know this area, have, uh, have the seismics and will do some definitely uh, seismics. And it will most probably happen what happened uh, in, in, in uh, Lebanon because part of the block uh, that Lebanon gave to a consortium of companies uh, that was close to uh, Israeli borders, they said that, well, we will not drill in disputed areas. So, uh, you know, this might happen also for block five, uh, Qatar Petroleum and Exxon can say that, well, our drilling will take place in the area that is not uh, disputed or overlapping with Turkish continental shelf. But again, if Turkey backtracks, uh, 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 doesn't say much on this issue, this would be a, a wrong, uh, a wrong way to go ahead. So I think uh, this I, I covered, uh, I don't know how much time I, I, I used, but this is uh, more or less the, the issue. But one more thing to add, in this uh, in this issue, this overlapping uh, things and maritime conflicting maritime oh, bond can, boundaries, you can also open that uh, the blocks. You can show a map if you yeah. want. We, it will be uh, all of us. You have the right to use it. You can uh, okay. Oh, 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 okay. It's a very nice uh, background, so Matt also uh, will be using this, and we can visualize. You know. Okay, uh, so let I me show. That you are a fan of making nice maps on that. Uh, well, this time I can. Uh, well, I can show this one full. For example, this is the the, the, the area. This is not my map, but uh, this Middle East Ener Energy Survey. Uh, you know, this is uh, this area. Uh, this block ten. So. This is red area is Turkish continental shelf, so outside of, of that area. But block five, this is block five, and actually... It is overlapped. I, I go backwards somehow. 
I sh show it here better. Yeah, yeah, uh, this is my map. Yeah, yeah uh, sure. this is block block five. Uh, you see, uh, nearly uh, half is actually within the uh, Turkish continental shelf, and Turkish Petroleum already made two drillings in block six uh, and block seven, uh, overlapping uh, with uh, Greek Cyprus uh, Cyprus blocks, and uh, and uh, I think the uh, the the uh, issue is is that. Uh, this will cause cause a problem. Just a second. Okay. This is telephone. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is an important part. But so at the end, all will come to again this maritime uh, border disputes. Yeah. Yeah. Here, one thing that is important to to keep in mind is that. Uh, I, I stop sharing. Everybody talks about international law based on international law, etc. No, all these bilateral agreements or unilateral declarations of EEZ or continental shelves uh, are just a claim. Okay, this should be uh, understood very well. Uh, it is not set in stone because what international law says is that bilateral maritime delimitation agreements are not worth much if they do not consider the interests of the third parties. In other, uh, in other words, uh, uh, this bilateral or unilateral uh, uh, bilateral agreements or unilateral declarations cannot adversely affect the rights of a country that is not party to it. That is a, this is a simple sentence that uh, I, I, I wrote with uh, Anastanich. Uh, he's an international lawyer and he's also a member of the courts uh, in uh, uh, in this uh, maritime dispute issues uh, uh, in an article that was published last last year we uh, discussed these issues uh, in in detail the article is available on the on, on the website of this international journal so this is the the, the issue it is like in in the, in the black sea the countries came together they determined the, uh, the 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 lines and they all accepted. Yeah. Whereas in in the in the East Mediterranean we have unilateral and bilateral agreement. Even the Turkey uh, uh, Libya agreement doesn't mean much in terms of international law, unless all the countries are party to it and agree uh, can come up with an agreement. Then we can say that well, this is my exclusive economic zone. But in Turkey, another thing that is wrongly used by Turkish officials and also in the media, when you look at the uh, old announcements in uh, Greek Cyprus uh, or uh, European uh, Commission um, articles and announcements, they always say that, for example, uh, blocks, uh, Greek Cyprus blocks within the uh, Cyprus exclusive economic zone, or the drilling take, take place in uh, block uh, 10 within the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus. In Turkey, in the media, we don't say much. We have to en uh, emphasize all the time within the Turkish continental shelf. That is it. That is it. You have to repeat it. You have to repeat all the time. So this is uh, this is just the political and legal uh, aspects of the issue. And of course, this issue will become hotter and hotter when uh, Exxon uh, will declare uh, the planned exploratory well in Block Five, and also uh, when it starts drilling in the coming days in Block Ten. And then Pepe, uh, maybe I just gave you more 10, 15 minutes, I think. So 
Uh, okay. Just with one word, we can just skip to uh, to uh, let's say the two. Sure. So, is, are you okay? Do you have any other? But I will be giving any three or more minutes after the the presentation as well. Okay. Also raising that. So, but I would just to thank you very much because studying with you is very important to understand the what is the amount, what we are talking about, the 10, 10, 10 TCM, as you said, and also the, the customers, who will be the customers. And uh, it is understood for me, at least, that it is a tool for the Greek Cypriots and they don't want to lose it. It is a political leverage for Asian and Mediterranean delimitation. So this is why this is not an issue which will be solved easily, you know. Well, otherwise, uh, that is, you can just check it out, the demand, looking for the markets and sending the gas. For me, one of the most logical markets will be India. Why not? So you can collect the gas in Jordan, then have a pipeline from Saudi Arabia to Oman, and you can just have a kind of subsea passage reaching out to India. It will help U.S. to fight with the China in the trade war as well. So I also write it down something I can also share with you. Sorry, Ambassador, but thank you very much. I have the questions uh, just right after that. I, I would like to give the floor to uh, Matt. Please, Matt. Uh, sure, Matt, yeah, and thanks very much, Sobet. A map for us, uh, Sobet, it will be very good for us if you open a map of that. Uh, I can open a, a bigger no, no. map, maybe. Uh, also, and also the audience can understand what we are talking okay, about. Okay, okay. I will find an appropriate map and I will share uh, while... Uh... Matt is speaking. Well, the map just starts. Thank you. Yeah, and so, but I'd love to get a copy of that map you drew as well. It's a great one that shows the you know, the overlap of the Turkish EEZ claim and the, and the blocks, the licensed blocks. Um, so that's a good place, a really good place to uh, leave it for me or, or, or transition to me because this, it's exactly these uh, conflicting claims that I'd like to discuss in a little more detail from a, from a different context, slightly. So the conventional wisdom everywhere, except in Turkey, is that Turkey is violating international law, right? And, um, you know, the, the Greek Cypriots have been extremely skillful in using the EU's principle of solidarity of member states to get the entire European Union on their side. Um, and, and then the United States has followed for domestic political reasons, but also I think just because of a general lack of appreciation in the U.S. for what Sohbet said, how these easy claims are claims. They are only claims. The maritime boundaries are not, there's not like an accepted interpretation uh, of international law for each of these boundaries. Um, as the law of the sea states, right, and Sohbet, you were getting at this, um, and to paraphrase, of course, uh, anytime maritime boundaries are drawn, there will inevitably be differencing, different points of view among neighboring states. That's inevitable. And so the law of the sea, yeah, while, while it does say, while it does say that, for example, uh, in, in determining an exclusive economic zone, that islands uh, acquire full force in terms of drawing a line 200 uh, miles offshore for an EEZ. Yes, the, the law of the sea does say that. Uh, on the other hand, um, the law of the sea also says that when there is a dispute like this one, the two neighboring states have an obligation to uh, listen to each other, to take each other's core interests into account, and behave in a reasonable way and come to a mutually acceptable uh, resolution of the disputes. And so in, in this case at hand, of course, that means the Aegean, and that means the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so the, the, the international debate has been very skewed. The international debate, except in Turkey, assumes that the, the, the Greek claims and the Greek Cypriot claims are international law written in stone and that Turkey doesn't even have a right to dispute them. So the, the Greek Cypriots and Greeks have been very skillful in saying, well, Turkey violates international law because it doesn't recognize the Greek and the Greek Cypriot claims. Well, Turkey's not obligated to recognize those claims. Turkey is obligated to pursue its own interests and then find a reasonable compromise. And so throughout all these years, I think Ankara has felt that it has been very reasonable it's been quiet, as Sohbet said. <laughs> Maybe Turkey, uh, your recommendation is Turkey should be out there all the time reminding the rest of the world that it has its own claims and the, the Greek Cypriot licensed blocks, licensed blocks are simply claims. 
Now, Turkey hasn't done that, and, and it hasn't gotten any credit for being reasonable. And I think that's uh, why that is, I think, is largely due to the fact that, again, um, EU member state solidarity ha has led to the, all the EU and therefore the U.S. to follow in saying that, okay, these Greek Cypriot claims are, that is what international law is. Uh, and then also Turkey suffered from, the, of course, the deterioration of its relationship with, well, with both the U.S., and also with Israel. I mean, in Washington, uh, when, when you're seen as uh, falling out of favor or out of the consensus view of NATO vis-a-vis -vis Russia with the S-400 purchase, and if you, you don't have normal relations with Israel, it's really hard in Washington to get a fair hearing. I mean, in other words, to have people be willing to consider your alternative view when it clashes with, you know, with what the conventional wisdom such as it is, is. So, but Turkey has been very um, uh, moderate. So first, you know, the, the Greek Cypriots started licensing those blocks south of the island years ago, right? For, for a decade, Turkey didn't say anything except there was one instance uh, several years ago with a gunboat uh, or a naval ship. Uh, and that, you know, that, that faded from view. Then we had the, the ENI uh, uh, ex exploration ship that was, uh, it wasn't blocked by Turkish naval vessels, but they, <laughs> they very cleverly uh, sort of got in the way of the ENI vessel and then pulled back when the ENI vessel turned. And then, and then the Turkish naval ships again obstructed the path of the ENI vessel, Did, didn't threaten it at all, just said, oh, it just so happens that, you know, our paths are intersecting. It was, it was a very clever way of doing things without threat, without using the uh, actual threat of force. <clears throat> but th th those are the only instances, really, where Turkey has kind of flexed its muscles. And, and the reason was that, you know, throughout the period of the UN-mediated talks uh, pursuing a a Cyprus solution, you know, so a, a reunification of the island into a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation, uh, Turkey didn't want to torpedo the talks. Um, and so it, it bit its tongue for years, more or less, on the licensing of those blocks. And it was only after, in 2017, the, the, the complete collapse of the talks in Town, Switzerland, that then Turkey began to, um, to exercise its rights as it sees it, as it sees its rights in terms of EEZs. Um, and, and so we all know what happened. I mean, the, you know, the, that es the escalation of tension increased with France sending a couple fighters to Crete and then, uh, you know, the Greek Navy patrolling, the Turkish Navy patrolling and accompanying the uh, exploration and production ships of TPAO had that collision in, I guess, in August of 2020 of a Greek and a Turkish naval vessel. So that's when tensions were at their peak. And then what happened? Turkey de-escalated again. So there haven't been any TPAO ships prowling about in the Eastern Mediterranean since then. Angela Merkel played a huge role, right, in getting the EU to, to de-escalate and to make sure that, you know, in the lead up to the EU summit at the end of last year, Turkey had a chance to bring its, its ships back into port and then to focus on uh, exploration in the Black Sea rather than the Eastern Mediterranean. And then there were the talks, of course, between Greece and Turkey uh, brokered by Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, to again to reduce tension between the NATO members, uh, and, and, and Turkey hasn't gotten any credit again <laughs> for that sort of de-escalation. Um, and so, um, I, I, I I do agree totally with Sobet that um, you know when, when Exxon was first drilling. Uh, in Block 10, uh, I mean, I know for a fact that the Turkish Foreign Ministry decided uh, not to escalate. And I, I was one of the people predicting while the tension could really increase back then when Exxon was getting ready to drill. Uh, but for exactly the reasons that were stated, uh, because that, that piece of where the exploration happened in Block 10 is not uh, disputed by Turkey, uh, the Turkish foreign ministry was hoping that, okay, the, the, the rest of the international community would recognize that Turkey behaved in this case in a, in a reasonable way as called for under the law of the sea, uh, trying to take into account uh, the interests uh, of Greece and of the Greek Cypriots. Uh, but no, uh, I think nobody recognized that. Um, uh, what else to say? So yeah, the, the, I think there, is a, there, there, there are reasonable ways to resolve this maritime dispute. I mean, it's, you know, the, the crux of the problem, right, is that Turkey with the longest coastline in the Eastern Mediterranean has one of the smallest EEZs because of the value uh, uh, called for, demanded by Greece uh, to this tiny island of, of Castelloriso or Mais, 
uh, which is hundreds of kilometers from the Greek mainland. And because of it, if you draw the line, uh, the EEZ line 200 miles from, from that tiny island, 10 square miles or 10 square kilometers, well, we get we get the map that we have that Greek claims, of, uh, according to which Turkey has such a small EEZ and Greece is, is enormous. So there ought to be a way to uh, be able to reach a compromise whereby, you know, the Greeks agree that the EEZ of Kastelorizu will be limited just as they agree in the Aegean, right, to, to the maritime boundaries being limited. They don't claim the full 10 miles because if, if Greece did, and it's not just that Turkey would consider that a causes bede, but also because Turkey would have no easy in some places where the islands, the Greek islands are closer uh, to the Turkish mainland. So Greece has set a precedent of being reasonable in the Aegean, although, you know, Turkey would say not always, not when it comes to remilitarization or militarization of the islands. Um, but, but it has, Greece has set the precedent of recognizing sometimes islands aren't entitled to a 200 mile EEZ. So th th there ought to be a comp compromise that could be reached with regard to roads, where Turkey is now, it's EEZ agreement back from November of 2019 with Libya uh, denies Rhodes much of, a, much of an EEZ. Well, you know, Turkey could say Rhodes is entitled to more, but Castello Rizzo has to have much less. There's a compromise out there to be made, but Greece just hasn't wanted to discuss it. And the Greek Cypriots don't want to discuss any compromise either. And, you know, in my post-government time in the private sector, for full disclosure, I mean, I'm on the board of Turkas, Turkish uh, downstream energy company, we had been leading, uh, co-leading an effort to build a consortium of natural gas buyers in Turkey, like Turkas, which has a gas-fired power plant in Denizli. Um, and so we, we really thought that the pipeline uh, made sense to go to, to Turkey from Israel uh, because, you know, Turkey's got the largest and, and the only really expanding natural gas market in the immediate neighborhood. For political reasons, uh, it didn't happen. But, but at that time, um, we believe there was another sort of compromise that could have given everybody a bit of what they wanted. So the Greek Cypriots really wanted at that time an LNG export terminal in Vasilikos, right, on, on the southern coast of Cyprus. Um, the Turkish government at the time really wanted this pipeline. Uh, the companies that were developing uh, Leviathan, the, the leaders at least, uh, Delek and, and then Noble, but now Chevron, were the same ones or are the same ones that are as, as are developing Aphrodite. So again, if, if, if people were being reasonable, um, there would be a way for those operating companies to, to um, use early revenues from a natural gas pipeline to Turkey, which really made commercial sense, um, use the early revenues somehow to reduce the perceived economic, financial, and political risks for uh, uh, a natural gas export terminal on, on the island of Cyprus in Vasilikos. Um, and, and it's sort of fortunately uh, at the time, um, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, you know, the Greek Cypriots hadn't discovered as much gas as they had anticipated. So there was a window of opportunity to pursue this sort of a, of a, a multi-faceted uh, agreement involving the private sector, involving Greece, involving Turkey. And, you know, in return, the Greek Cypriots would not object to a pipeline crossing their claim to EEZ. Um, but it never was possible politically. So, you know, when, when, when I was running into the, 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 the immutable uh, opposition to any compromise at all among the Greek Cypriots, well, then I started to think, well, may, maybe there could be an ele electricity connection, right? I mean, um, the Greek Cypriot side of the island needs more base load of electricity to be able to utilize fully the installed capacity for renewables. So for natural, I mean, for uh, uh, wind and solar. Um, and so if, if there was an electricity connection from Turkey, for example, could be from Israel too, but from Turkey, um, there would be more base load on the island. The Greek Cypriots could, could fully utilize then their, their installed renewable capacity. Everybody should like that. The EU wants that. Also, with such an uh, electricity interconnection synchronized with the Turkish grid, the Greek Cypriots would get a synchronized electricity connection with the EU, right, via Turkey and into Bulgaria. That, that's a big strategic idea for the EU on energy, for the Greek Cypriots. Uh, so having a conversation like this one time uh, with some Greek Cypriot friends, I was with a, a chief of staff of a, a very senior uh, Greek Cypriot politician, and I laid out this idea, and she just laughed, and she said, so you want me to propose, uh, this would be in Parliament, uh, that we compromise with Turkey on electricity imports in a win-win situation. She said, do you want my boss to commit political suicide? <laughs> That's just not possible. So I, I, I'm sort of out of ideas. I mean, there are ideas out there that have been promoted for years. Um, I think now with the two-state solution to Cyprus that the Turkish Cypriots with Turkey support are now pushing, um, I, I, I think the game is over. 
um, in, ter in terms of finding a compromise. I think the East Med, at least in its natural gas form, forum, or, or even if it becomes energy and it's electricity sharing, it's designed to exclude Turkey. That's the whole idea. Uh, and so um, energy has become a divisive force in the Eastern Mediterranean when it comes to Turkey, even as the rest of the EU and, and the United States, they think, oh, it's great what's happening on energy because Cypriots, Israelis, Greeks, uh, Egyptians are all working together. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a tough situation for Turkey because just flexing its muscles is only going to uh, engender further hostility and, and make Turkey seem less reasonable when in fact it is holding some really strong international cards, international legal cards that simply boil down to everybody needs to be reasonable. Everybody needs to recognize everybody else's interests and come up with a solution that, that is mutually agreeable. Uh, I don't say that because I live in Turkey. If I was you know, still in the U.S. government, this would be my position as well. I may lose those arguments. I lost a lot of arguments when I had some senior positions in the U.S. government. Um, but it's not just a matter of, of what's fair for Turkey. It's a matter of what makes practical sense, even commercial sense. If that gas isn't burned, like Sohbet said, into electricity that's exported, which is the most logical thing to do, um, its natural home, its natural market should be in Turkey. Uh, and it, it's not easy to finance investment in, you know, later stages of Leviathan. Uh, the you know, private equity firms I've talked to say, we don't know if we could ever, ever come up with a financially and commercially attractive way to, to monetize Leviathan gas. And yeah, right now, gas prices have, have spiked for unusual reasons. Uh, but there is a hell of a lot of natural gas out there that's going to be looking for markets uh, two years from now, three years, even one year. I mean, the, the natural gas, uh, you know, demand curve is, is still... Uh, in backwardation. So it's still saying that in a, a year from now, two years from now, prices will be lower. And so we'll be having a different conversation then. And a lot of gas uh, of that of that enormous amount, the 5 trillion cubic meters that Sohbet had mentioned that have been discovered uh, is probably never going to get developed. And so I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, thank you very much uh, for your words uh, and also the thoughts. It's very important to understand the issue. You know, you can, you can, select one side but you have to be we are all at least working with the state and know the kind of uh, reflections but we have to analyze and underline the realities as Sofet did and as you did it is very important so uh, the electricity is one of the most important way to solve that problem and even you are looking for the Aegean uh, islands they are using mazot it's the free yeah. water so, uh, and I was just crying for the last 15 years to sell some kind of, you know, habash uh, depots together with the Ege gas LNG to that islands to use natural gas in the electricity. No one do anything. As the senior government official said to, to you, it is a political suicide for all of the Greeks and the Greek Cypriots. It's also clear. But, you know, uh, when you look at the realities, Egypt is there. Zor is the biggest one. Yeah. And Egypt has the chance to reach out the European Union with the subsea pipelines already in there. So they can use it or they can construct another one. Why they use Greece? And the, why the Israelis have to pay more pipelines cost? Subsea plus Mora Island plus inside the Greece than to reaching out Italy. It's meaningless. If it is the case for Italy, then construct the pipeline to Italy. And you don't need that pipeline in this case. So this is why the logical thing, as you said, is having a pipeline, solving the problem of Lebanon and also Syrian issue, then laying a pipeline from Israel to Turkey. This is the logical, economical, most economical option, I can say, in my opinion. And also to use LNG, they can use it. They can construct an LNG facilities but the Egyptians has to speed up the process because European Union decides zero emission as of 2040. So they have only 20 years to sell the gas. <laughs> so this is why, as the Sohbet mentioned, there will be a kind of mix in the electricity production and generation and transmitting it. So you can find a way after that 20 years for Mediterranean gas to be used in the electricity system, I can say. But otherwise, as I said before, the Greek side always using this 
as a political tool and for their domestic politics. And time to time, uh, and thanks to God, we discovered the Gazan Black Sea. Maybe I would like to ask a question to you as well. What will be the effect of Black Sea if the discovery rate will be triggered to eight, uh, 842, maybe one TCM they are talking about? Uh, we are very happy on that because it is not a disputed area. So we can show that how the Black Sea countries uh, working together. And it's funny thing is in here that when I was a part of Botash, uh, we opened that uh, pipeline to Greece as mm -hmm. the Turkey. And we, I was the first guy who signed the agreement with DEPA to mm -hmm. sell the gas to uh, Greece as well. So there is top and ton up in there. There is Turkey, Russia, uh, Turkey, Greece connection is in there. And uh, they have to be the one who is backing us that the two nation states in there and also having the gas together. And Turkey is ready with the pipelines, with the infrastructure, with the with a, being a biggest gas market in there, more than 50, 55 PCM in a year. So we are we have to find a logical uh, let's say the solutions, if it is not a political kind mm -hmm. of, uh, let's say the tool used by the politicians. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering as the final questions on what would be the effect of Black Sea on uh, the East Med as well. And I would like to underline the importance of Arab gas pipeline, as Sofet mentioned. When I was a part of Potash, it was my uh, under my duty, I can say. Mm -hmm. We did a lot and we take this pipeline to the border of Turkey as well, and it will be connected from Bitlis. Uh, it's a 40, 40 inches pipeline in there. So it is also absorbable by Turkey as well. So an Alaska, Arab gas pipeline is just there. So it can be utilized for this uh, aim, I think. So sorry, I am just leaving the floor to you both for your final words, including what is your thinking about the legacy and effects of uh, on uh, East Met as well. Maybe we can start with Ambassador. Ah, okay, okay, sure, sure. I thought because Soviet had to rest, rest. Sure, <laughs> I'm so. I think um, <laughs> I I don't see the Black Sea discovery having much of an impact on Eastern Mediterranean gas simply because you know we've just been talking about how there really is no viable option for Eastern Med gas to make it to Turkey via pipe. I uh, mean could come, you know, in the form of LNG. I mean, if more gas goes south to Egypt, if Egypt expands over time, who knows what's going to happen with future discoveries in Egypt and whether they'll expand their LNG export capacity. At some point, we can't see in the future. Maybe there could be some Israeli gas coming into Turkey. Uh, but I, I, I don't see that poss possibility on the near-term horizon. So the main impact of Black Sea gas uh, at least based on what the Turkish government has said so far, is, is domestic consumption in Turkey, which will you know, reduce the current account deficit of Turkey. So that's good. Um, it will also provide Turkey uh, optionality and leverage when it renews, when it negotiates contracts like it is doing now with Russia's Gazprom uh, and with others and with Azerbaijan. Um, and, and, and with Iran. So uh, what, what, I, what I find really exciting though, if I, if I go out of my current private sector life and go back to you know, the life of a, of a US foreign policy official and drawing strategic lines on the map, I mean, Turkish gas from, from the Black Sea to Ukraine could be a huge geostrategic game changer. Uh, people aren't really, I, I haven't heard of any plans to do that, but if there could be a pipeline that lands that gas, even you know, in, in Romania or in Ukraine, wow, that would be a dramatic shift in the geoeconomics and geopolitics uh, of well, the current tensions we see, the enormous tensions between Russia uh, and Ukraine. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and I just, I, I would actually wrap up with asking my own question too about, about the Arab pipeline. I mean, how close to the to Bitlis does it come? I guess it comes through Syrian territory. And what sort of investment is needed to, to make that connection? And, and why isn't it happening? Because of the war in Syria, I guess. <laughs> it, is, it is not a big deal, I can say. You know, I remember some figures, it's nothing. You know, you can just do it in six months to one year if okay. you want. So, but you know, it depends the situation because we don't know after the war how all that infrastructure is just damaged or whatever, yeah. we don't know. But it is it's only five, one, uh, $100 million from uh, the north of Damascus to Turkish border, then to, then to 
connected to the bit list. So it's only, I can say, uh, just 100 million dollars at most. I remember as the number. So it is nothing, and it has that to be. Uh, let's say the numbers could be this decreased as well because you know uh, it was some 10 years ago, or I don't mm. know. <laughs> okay. But I, I have another question as well to you, Matt. Uh, before we leave, you know, uh, what if Turkey decides to use Black Sea and uh, to create a kind of non-ending disputed areas in Cyprus. But I'm just trying to say that. What if Turkish Cypriots vote in a referendum to join Turkey? Huh. Like the crime, another crime issue I'm just talking about. So mm. it, is a, it is also a political game. If mm. the Greeks continue to use that political stuff against Turkey, bothering, squeezing, in all means, using European Union, also you know, uh, convincing US or whatever kind of conflict situation. Then, if the Turkish side, the Turkish Cypriots, just decide in a referendum to vote for joining Turkey and creating a new Crimea, it means it all will be a meaning for ever continue, <laughs> kind of forever a disputed area for everyone. Mm -hmm. But for, uh, it, it is a possibility as well. I can. I'm just expecting. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it is, and that would be. I mean, that would be disastrous. I think for Turkey in terms of you know its international reputation. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think what they've oh, settled on now. Is, yeah. <laughs> well, they've settled on the TRNC, you know, being an independent country, and uh, uh, you know that that's kind of the first step. That's much. I think that's much less controversial than a referendum because you know, I mean, Turkey that. Uh, you know, it has a right to, to make such a claim. Um, but that's a fascinating idea. I mean, that would be an absolute game changer, Cenk, if that were to happen. Of course, if there were such a referendum, <laughs> it really changes. Maybe, it. maybe and, Turkey just can use this to get a compromise and to shake the hands. So, it, but at great, at great political cost to itself, though. Yeah. Actually, there was one more thing I wanted to say, too, about, about the, the Cyprus dispute that's overlooked in, in the U.S. and in Europe, which is that you know, the, if you go back to the treaties that founded the state, the Constitution of 1960, the Treaties of Guarantee, um, you know, Turkish Cypriots are supposed to participate in, <laughs> as a community, right, in any decision of national significance to, to the entire island. So it actually, j just like kicking the Turkish Cypriots out of the government in whatever it was in 63, violated the Constitution, so, do, so does simply licensing these blocks uh, when the government is entirely in the hands of only one of the two communities on the island. So that actually is a breach of international law, but nobody talks about that. And Turkey doesn't even talk about that, maybe because it feels it would get shouted down. But it's true. Th that is internationally, uh, legally uh, an immutable fact, <laughs> that the Constitution is being violated uh, in, in this way. Thank you. Well, I was, I was just thinking that, you know, sending a letter to United Nations from the Turkish Cypriots by asking that we did our homework, they didn't, and they are excluding us. If you are not joining or forcing them to accept, create a two nation state together, then we are giving you only six months to everyone, you know, to, to United Kingdom, to Greece, to Turkey, to United Nations, US, European Union. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, a fair kind of letter from the Turkish Cypriots to finding a solution. Otherwise, uh, it is meaningless to be a, just a kind of, you know, like a Texas lone star in mm. there, you know, shining star. They need a shining star. So I'm just thinking like that. So, may come. Yeah, yeah, why not? Maybe it can be a kind of the part of the solution. So uh, do you have any questions to uh, Sofet as well? Uh, I uh, wanted to ask Sofet, yeah, about the future of uh, natural gas in Egypt. Yeah, that's from there, yeah. There was a lot of excitement about, you know, it, it, toward the West in Egypt about, about, you know, possible discoveries, very large ones. And then so how do you see that? What's the prospectus for that? And, and do you imagine more LNG investments in Egypt or no? The, the, the two, I know they're still under full, you know, full capacity in terms of usage. Uh, but do you see somewhere down the road the possibility of additional LNG export investment in Egypt? And also uh, uh, Egyptian uh, LNG to Turkey. So could you please add up this? They are also yes. on I keep on I that. Yes. Uh, just for the first part, as you see in this slide, uh, Matt, uh, all the gas discovered in Egypt is 
in the eastern part of the uh, Mediterranean. Yeah. Uh, the prospects in, in, in the second half of the area here is a huge area. Only two wells have been drilled. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is nothing. And uh, Egyptian government have, uh, have made uh, some bilateral agreements and awarded uh, some of these blocks to giants like BP, Chevron, Exxon, uh, Total, etc. Uh, now, in the meantime, this COVID came and uh, actually not much has happened before. Besides, Egypt uh, has awarded these blocks, you know, these deep offshore blocks uh, last year and uh, the bid round closed 30th of September. Still, we haven't heard anything. Now, and we haven't heard anything, even the exploratory programs in these, in these blocks. So there are hopes, of course, but uh, now the companies are maybe becoming more prudent and doesn't want to spend uh, too much money because they would prefer uh, low risk uh, areas because here it is high risk and high may also have high reward. But there are there is uh, there is there is risk, so the potential is there. Uh, now the Egyptian government, for the moment, does not think of expanding its LNG capacity. But if needed, there is room. There is room in the same place. In the same place, just uh, uh, increase the number of trains. So that is that is not a uh, not an issue, but. Uh, now we, we we really don't know oh, what what will happen because on the other hand we are not uh, getting some very good news news from uh, some of the Egyptian fields even though uh, for example uh, in September uh, we had a record production in in Egypt gas production it was really uh, record. Uh, but in uh, in November it went down a little a little bit because of some of the uh, technical problems uh, in West Ni uh, Nile Delta, even even in Zorsa, there are some question marks. Maybe it was pushed too much further uh, beyond its capacity because they want to increase production. Uh, they forced, and then when the prices went down, the Egyptian government said, "No, you have to reduce your production." These are not good things uh, for 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 the uh, production uh, companies, you know. Uh, but the uh, the uh, when the production picked up uh, now uh, the summer is the uh, the peak uh, demand for for Egypt now what we have seen is the the uh, exports uh, LNG exports went up very much and we also saw uh, a lot of spot uh, LNG uh, exports to to Turkey so uh, you know on the one hand. Maybe the diplomatic relations not very good, but uh, spot LNG is uh, flowing flowing to Turkey without uh, any problem. Now, uh, as a maybe general uh, general thing uh, to to just uh, sum up, yes, uh, there is still some potential, but maybe uh, uh, we would need a game changer. So far, we have been talking only gas in in east med mm -hmm. if we have if we happen to have a, a significant oil discovery in the region this could happen in lebanon for example or even uh, even in egypt this would change the whole picture and uh, for gas exports so lng yes uh, but the market will not be in my view to Europe and forget the pipelines because uh, when we talk about European gas demand in the future, the first thing come to mind is European ambitions with this green deal and the place of natural gas. So Europe does not want to continue uh, consuming natural gas. Instead, 
the uh, in the future when you look at the recent projections with net zero uh, assumptions etc uh the gas demand in europe will not increase much even then the part of natural gas in the gas demand will be one third what are the other thirds is uh the hydrogen and biomethane so there is not much hope to really focus on uh on european markets if you are told, thinking about uh 10 20 years ahead so the market is definitely could be india very good uh very good place or uh, asia by uh via lng and if it is by pipeline the best way to go using existing pipeline that you see here uh, arab gas pipeline that extends all the way to the border of turkey with branches to to uh jordan lebanon so this is the only way uh, only infrastructure that connects all the countries important countries in the region maybe in the future an extension could be made to to cyprus why not not only this a similar similar could be developed like an electricity integration an electricity ring like this we have in uh, gas ring so uh but but i talked about uh, a lot about the the uh the upstream uh, production etc but the, the countries in the region have to rush they cannot sit on these reserves another 5 6 7 years the train is moving the train is leaving the the, the station because of all this this climate issue pushing for hydrogen and uh, biomethane and and biogas on with together with uh carbon capture and storage you know these if if uh, no radical move takes place in the region unfortunately there is the danger that the uh, most of this undiscovered gas will become stranded yeah. in the region that is that is for sure now how to move ahead you have to move ahead in two ways one this exploration production wise and the best way okay we 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 have some conflicts uh uh some tensions between the countries but to to create kind of a joint upstream uh and uh, uh, field development and production mechanism and even uh, a joint uh this exportation until these uh all these uh, political disputes and maritime etc are, are are solved develop a joint mechanism you know every uh, state owned or or designated uh, company or or uh, official institution takes takes part uh, do a consortium but develop these these this area now as soon as as soon as possible i say because i said before the boom in gas demand will be asia and particularly uh lng in lng before we were seeing that uh spot lng the share of spot lng in total lng uh uh trade was increasing but with this extremely high volatility in in lng and natural gas prices that we have seen uh what we have been witnessing in the past uh, two three months is that long-term contracts are coming back the countries have started to to sign instead of spot or uh, near term up to one to uh up to one or three years um deals they are now moving back to signing 15 to 20 year deals with uh uh with asian customers so uh the region if they want to sell their gas they start they need to start uh signing contracts with asian buyers but how you can sign uh, asian uh, the contracts with asian buyers if you are not sure 
how much you will be able to uh, export in the future. But for that, you have to explore, produce. I mean, before produce, you have to develop the discoveries and, and produce. This is the way, only way to, to, to catch the train uh, in the past, in the next uh, three, four years, if there is no radical uh, move takes place in the region, unfortunately, most of the undiscovered gas will remain uh, in the region because the market is a Asia and they have to uh, sign contracts. And don't forget, most of the Egyptian gas is sold in spot basis. Yeah. In spot basis, you know, uh, there is no guarantee. Otherwise, Egypt will rely on on Israeli gas uh, in the in the in the future, and the others will not be able to export anything. Yeah. So this yeah. is that is why again uh, we come to the way of uh, the the importance of cooperation. That is why I always say the region needs a geopolitical game changer. Mm -hmm. That is it. And the name of this geopolitical ga game changer is cooperation. Without cooperation, again, most of the gas will be stranded. Yeah. Uh, do you have any questions to Matt as well? Uh, so that otherwise I will be doing my... Yes, course. this... Uh, just a, a quick question about the uh, the U.S. involvement in, in not only in, uh, in uh, maritime boundary issues between uh, these uh, discussions between uh, Lebanon and uh, and Israel also uh, the 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 US uh, support of this new agreement to sell gas to uh, to Lebanon and the impact on Syria this is uh, I mean the volumes are not very big but the significance is 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 extremely high. Yeah, that that, that is enormously significant politically. Um, yeah, so I don't see the grand strategic vision now that that's required. Uh, I mean, in Washington, to to bring all the parties together in ways that I was hinting at could work. And so, to give some a specific view of that. So what I, when I was working on that uh, arrangement whereby, you know, we would get Delek and Noble or Delek and Chevron to agree to channel some of the early revenues from a, from a potential pipeline to Turkey uh, into investment in an LNG terminal uh, on, you know, in Vasilikos. Um, you know, the companies were not against it. Um, the Israeli government was definitely not against it uh, either. Um, the Greek Cypriot government was, for the reasons we know, political orthodoxy. And so I want to see my colleague, my old friend from, from you know, my diplomatic career who happened to be the U.S. ambassador in Nicosia. And he got so angry with me when I proposed the following, that why doesn't the United States step in like, like it did for Baku Tbilisi Jehan and the South Caucasus gas pipeline, which is you help the, the countries and the companies negotiate their framework agreements, their legal and political framework agreements. And that way, then you've got political cover for the Greek Cypriots also to go ahead and do what they need to do anyway, get, get what they want, get the infrastructure they want. Back then, the LNG terminal. Uh, and he got really angry. Uh, with me. He, he, he essentially threw me out of his office because he assumed that somehow I was acting like an agent on behalf of the Turkish government because they're trying to use, you know, energy to in a way that Turkey didn't oppose. And I, I told him, I might say straightforwardly, look, I'm doing this because of my private sector interest. This makes a lot of sense for the company I represent. There, there's no hidden agenda here, but it was like, no way, because you know, the Turks want to um, instrumentalize, if you will, energy for Turkey's political gain. The U.S. isn't going to touch uh, any sort of conceptualizing in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I don't think that view has changed. I, th I think I think still, like, as I was saying uh, during my intervention, the original one, the conventional wisdom is that really Turkey can't do anything right in foreign policy, that, that its foreign policy is broken. It's a violator of international law. And, you know, it, it's good that there's a, uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Natural Gas Forum that doesn't include, does not include Turkey. I think that's seen still as a positive in Washington. And I think that's a gigantic strategic mistake because what it's going to end up doing is, yeah, not, not only dividing all the, the uh, Turkey from all the other countries, but as, as you were saying, Sofet, it's going to result 
<laughs> in these uh, fields, this gas being stranded and missed opportunities for investments that need to take place quickly. So the uh, U.S. will be interested in those one-offs. So like you said, you know, getting gas to Lebanon and, and, and then the fact that Israel and Egypt cooperate, that's a huge plus in Washington. Sorry. The, the uh, sending uh, or swapping whatever Israeli gas to uh, to Lebanon through Syria, the, the, the I mean, U.S. doesn't say anything. They're just saying that very well. Yeah, yeah. they're quite. I, I don't know what the latest you know thinking is like of Amos Hochstein and and the National Security Council staff. I I, I haven't had a chance to talk to them, but. Um, they would have to be quiet. I mean, to, to mm. simply to be silent is supportive, right? Because you don't, they don't yeah. want to expose Israel politically either or, or the Lebanese to actually getting molecules from Israel. So I would expect them to be quiet, but supportive uh, from behind the scenes. <laughs> so uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for, if you don't have any uh, final words, I would like to just compete with my, let's say the concluding remarks as the uh, advantage of the being a moderator in there. So uh, I am sure that the, if the Russians listen to us, they will be very happy after Sofet's word uh, because there is no gas to Europe from Ismet. So, and this is why the Russian strategy is there using Rosneft in Zor, using Novatek in Cyprus to, to be sure that this gas is not coming to Europe before the Russians signed the uh, long-term contracts with all uh, European countries, including Turkey, I can say. So they are very happy because we are not hearing any good news from Iraqi gas, any good news from Iranians, any good news from Cyprus, any good news from Ismet, uh, from uh, Egypt as well, because they are continuously, uh, let's say, uh, the final investment decisions just there. It's just a frozen in the in the fridge. So this is why they will be very happy. And the, the, I'm thinking the same with uh, Sofet as well, to create a cooperation. If the, the Turks and the Greeks just work together, there is a huge potential in Aegean for offshore wind. And we never yeah. talk about it. So, uh, and also that thing from Egegas to the Aegean islands for natural gas fire, uh, let's say the elected states there. Uh, and also, it is also good news for US LNG because Turkey also a big user of US LNG and US LNG will be reaching to European Union and it already started as well uh, by using the Turkish, uh, let's say the uh, Turkish card as well. And uh, the India will be, as I said, and also the Asia, but mainly India will be the next target for uh, I think is met. But more important than is that turn as an electricity and export as an electricity is could be a one of the good option and using the uh, uh, infrastructures like Arab gas pipeline will be the next uh, kind of uh, uh, tools for is met gas, I can say. I am just thinking uh, when I was a part of E.ON, there was a project, Desert Tech. It's uh, just coming from the sun and solar energy and renewables. Everyone just add up with their renewable potential to reach European markets. 15% of the European electricity will be, you know, then exported from uh, the countries of, uh, let's say, the, the Africa and also the Middle East and also Turkey. This kind of projects we need, I think. And we need that kind of accelerator like, like US and European Union without the political aspects. They have to focus on only the economics. Their main, you know, especially the European Union's main, uh, let's say the mistake is that when they just uh, decide to intervene, they are listening to the wrong people and they are making the political, uh, let's say the uh, always a political, uh, kind of attacks, but the economy has to be in the, in the, in the, in the core, I think. So, so I would like to thank to you both for your thank time you. and thank hope to you. you any thank other, you. let's say, uh, webinars or any other. Right. Then great. Hope, and in person. Please share some of your slides with me as well. And also Matt. Uh, I, if, I don't have any slides, but yeah. But I, I would love to get some, Matt, so mm -hmm. I love them. No, no, I'm asking Matt, uh, <laughs> Sophie to share with you, Matt. 
And also, ah, 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 great, thank you. Myself, you know, because okay, I, I will send some of some of the slides. Yeah, a couple of Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice bye. to be with you. Great yeah, to bye see bye. you. Great to learn from you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.